welcome to the Riggin Farm YouTube channel. In this video, we'll show you how we've been getting ready for our chicken processing workshop and the 100 plus tomato plants we transplanted into the garden. In a recent video, we showed how we finally completed the fence for our birds and rabbits, so Pachicho got released from chicken jail. Once she was out of the hutch, we moved Zelda's eight babies into it. There was a chicken that had been missing for over a month, and she reappeared from the other side of our property, and we were able to chase her through the gate to the fenced area. She was not happy about being held captive at first, but she did get over it after a few days. Here's one of our hens, Grey Booty, giving herself a dust bath. These various squash plants started to grow blossoms, and three days later they were getting massive. We'll be transplanting them as well as cucumbers and peppers into the garden in our next vlog. These tomato plants were started from seeds sown into soil blocks under our indoor growing lights before being moved outside to our small greenhouse. Several of the seeds didn't germinate until they were moved outside. Nature can be funny sometimes. We've been so busy with the many projects here at Riggin Farm that we let the weeds get ahead of us in the garden. There's also so much grass that wasn't here last year. We put down several sheets of weed fabric, but they didn't cover the entire area. We have some mahogany hibiscus growing in this fabric, and we discovered this bird's nest fungus growing in there. Apparently, it's actually beneficial and helps with decomposition of organic matter to enrich the soil. Before getting our transplants into the ground, we had to use our little tiller to break up the soil and help loosen the weeds. Afterwards, we went in by hand and pulled up as much as possible. We filled up two 5-gallon buckets. Next, we dug a trench on both sides of the trellis using a garden hoe. After a few hours of prepping the garden, it was finally time to get these tomatoes in the ground. You can see Ashley using a small knife to separate the soil blocks from one another. We should have gotten these plants in before they got root bound and entwined with each other, but they should be fine despite that. We placed the plants in the trench on their sides. This will cause the lower part of the plant to grow additional roots and become strong enough to support the weight of the fruit they grow. Of course this trellis will assist with that as well. We're growing about 30 varieties, including red, pink, yellow, orange, purple, and black tomatoes, as well as tomatillos. After all of the plants were in the trenches, we gave the root balls a good soak with our compost tea. We'll be making an in-depth video all about how we made our brewer and the process of making a batch of compost tea. You'll get to see the difference it makes in the garden. Make sure you subscribe if you don't already and hit the notification bell to ensure that you don't miss that one. Next, it was time to cover the plants with soil. Ashley carefully compressed the soil to help support the upper portion of the plant that isn't being covered. She also pulled off any leaves that would have been underground. There's no need for the plant to spend energy and nutrients on those. Don't feel too bad for her doing all this work. I helped a lot as well while I wasn't filming. I swear! One row down, one to go. Our farm cats tore up the screen door on our back deck, so this hummingbird managed to find its way in, but couldn't get out. I used a fly swatter to try and persuade it to go back out the doorway. It eventually flew out. A few days later, this bird got stuck too. It found its way out much more easily than the hummingbird. Ellen loved watching it from the rail. A few days later, he followed us up to the raised beds when we were going to start on another farm task. We received our sweet potato slips and needed to get them into the garden. Each plant was spaced 12 inches apart from the previous one. Using a small plastic trowel, Ashley made a spot for the slip to slip in and lightly compress the soil to hold the plant in place. Working in the raised beds is so much easier than the main garden because we don't have to contend with hard clay, rocks, sticks, weeds, and other debris. Our second row was 9 inches from the first, but the slips were spaced between the two in the previous row to still give them that 12 inch spacing. Math is surprisingly useful when farming. This lily, along with several others that have grown in the garden, was a surprise to us. 
We had tilled lime into the garden earlier in the year and had assumed that all of the gladiolus and lilies we planted last year had died. Life, uh, finds a way. Ellen was trying to figure out how to come help us. Hey, buddy, that's electric fence! Good thing it was turned off. We would have been so sad to hear his little kitty crying if he had gotten zapped. He's such a cute boy. He really wanted to get past the fence. Stop being a cute distraction, Ellen. We need to get back to work. The tomato plants had perked up since planting them three days prior. Laying them on their sides did not have a negative impact on their growth upward. The next thing we did was plant some onions between the first two rows of tomatoes. Onion and tomato roots grow at different levels, and the onions will help keep pests away from the tomatoes. These are great companion plants to maximize your harvest within a small space. Not that these 50-foot rows are small compared to a home garden, but it's still tiny compared to a large commercial farm. Planting onions is as simple as making a small hole, placing the bulb in it, and covering it up. Ashley is planting red onions here, and we put in white and yellow onions as well. Not only do these two plants grow well together, but tomatoes and onions pair nicely in numerous dishes prepared in the kitchen. They are definitely two of our favorites. We finally got some rain later that night to help hydrate all the plants as well as the pasture on the farm. The next day, the ground was nice and soft, so we installed a two and a half feet tall fence around our raised beds because rabbits were getting in there to eat the produce we're trying to grow. It's short enough for us to step over, and so far we haven't seen any evidence of rabbits getting past the fence. The asparagus that we planted with the strawberries are doing nicely. The sweet potatoes and onions are doing great in this bed. As you can see, we will have lots of onions this season. It was getting close to our first chicken processing workshop, and all these Cornish Cross and the two Rudd Rangers were approaching a good size. This video is being made before the workshop, but won't be published until a few days afterwards, so make sure you look out for a future video that covers how that went for us. We still needed to make our Rig and Farm branded butchering aprons. After creating a design, we used our Cricut Maker to cut it out onto some adhesive vinyl. Ashley removed the pieces we wanted the paint to go through for the screen printing process. She used this transfer paper to pick up the vinyl and keep the separate pieces where they belong when we put it onto the screen. We don't want the center of those G's to be off. She smoothed it out to minimize air bubbles and ensure every piece would stick. Now she's peeling off the backing. It's easy for the small pieces to stay on the backing, so you have to go slowly and carefully. Now to center it onto the screen. She's scraping it again to make sure the vinyl adheres to the screen. Time to peel off the transfer paper. She smoothed it out one last time to make sure everything is where it belongs. Looks good and straight! Tape was added along the border to keep the paint from accidentally getting onto the aprons. Sometimes a border on a design can look good, but that's not what we're going for with this project. Time to get the screen centered onto the apron and make sure it's exactly where we want it before the paint goes down. I held the screen down while Ashley applied the paint. Our oldest kid was the cameraman for this shot. A popsicle stick was used to make a thick line that will provide enough coverage to fill in the design. Here's the moment of truth! Let's lift the screen and see how we did. Not too bad! We made 16 of them and let the paint dry before using an iron to heat set them to prevent fading when they're washed. These aprons are included in the cost of our chicken processing workshop, but you can also buy them on our website while supplies last. Thank you for watching and following along on our farming journey. We'll see you next time!